over two years since Carter Murray took over as the CEO of FCB. And a lot has happened in these two years, globally and more so in India. Anyone who's been following the FCB Ulka story in India would know that whether it be change of guard, high profile exits or letting the old go for the new, FCB's India arm has seen a lot of action over the last year or so. So I caught up with the man at the helm, Carter Murray, to get his take on the recent happenings, how FCB is trying to shed its age-old, old-school perceptions, how it's dealing with the beast called digital and everything in between. Listen in. Thank you so much for joining us, Carter Murray. Truly a pleasure having you on Brand Equity. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So I believe two and a half years, uh, you know, as CEO of FCB, four or five times you visited India as the CEO of, of FCB. Yep. <clears throat> That's uh, particularly impressive because, you know, usually global CEOs don't visit us that often. <laughs> you know, once in like four or five years, once Martin Sorrell is the only aberration. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise... It's I'm not sure he'd like you using that word, but I'll <laughs> let you use it, not me. <laughs> um, so tell me, why, are you, why have you visited India so many times uh, in this new avatar that, that you have? Well, you know, I think for, for our industry globally, for, cl for clients, India is a hugely important part of the world. Um, you know, a few years ago, everyone was talking about brick markets. Sure. still are in some capacity, but India is, has managed to sustain some of that economic success. So um, I think it's just a hugely important uh, market. Uh, on the global stage, and so I think I have to invest my time being here. FCB India has been going through some transition, yep. uh, right? You've made some big changes, bold changes, uh, you know, within uh, within the agency. Uh, some of your old hands, uh, you know, are moving on, and rightfully so. You've got some new young blood. Uh, give me your view of when you came in and looked at the FCB India space, the, the agency, and how it was being run. What do you think? you thought then that needs to be needs to change ASAP so that you know they can be agile be more uh, you know nimble footed and be more with it um, you know FCB in India has as you know a reputation of uh, being a very strong local agency with a, a strong local management team and I didn't want to come in as some international person and and and, and disrupt everything mm. so I gave it some time to try and understand the team and what we have um, I think what we have at, at FCB uh, and FCB Orca yeah. is um, uh, deep-rooted client relationships, scale, um, solid creative work, strong strategy. Um, but what I felt we needed was an injection of fresh talent as well as giving some of the talent that had been there for a long time some ability to be upwardly mobile. So you are right, there are some partners who, who we owe a lot to who have put their lives into FCB Orca who uh, have moved into consultancy roles or retired. Um, and we've managed to promote from within. Uh, we've managed to recruit Rohit, which I think was a, a big coup for us, who's a, you know, just a great marketing brain and great guy. Um, and then I think creatively, you know, we have huge ambitions for the company creatively. So we, we again, one of the, I think, of our, my, our proudest hires in our global company was finding Swati and persuading Swati to become our CCO. Sure, so, you know, uh let me give you our, the industry's perception of FCB uh, Oka in India, right? Uh, so, while you've given a lot of adjectives to define uh, FCB Oka. Well, you asked Oka. for them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's an old school agency, to put it crisply. And it's, it's an agency that is just not looked at as, as fresh, young, uh, nimble, and somebody who's putting out cutting edge work. I mean, it, it truly has a perception problem. And, and a large part of it is because of the fact that, you know, they've had no real creative face. Uh, you know, the management that was running it is also very old school. Good, good guys, but old school, right? Uh, and so, so Rohit is in, then we had Sadbir, who just quit, uh, you know, FCB uh, in a matter of nine months. And now we have Swati. So what I, what I want to understand from you is, uh, what, are the, what are the small tweaks that you're making? Because you can't do anything too drastic overnight. So what are the small tweaks you're making to ensure that FCB in India doesn't seem like, you know, this really old, redundant agency? <laughs> well, I said to Rohit, I want you to come in and I want you to, to, to find the right partners from within and bring one or two from outside and for you to define what this agency is moving forward. And it's really exciting. So 
I think I think the, that's a great thing about being the global CEO. You can you can put that when you make pe sure. when you give people responsibility, sure. you open up their world to do it. So I'm not running India. Yep. Rohit is running India. Yep. And I think that's how it should be. I can tell you Swati coming in, I don't know if you've met Swati, yeah, but she is so inspiring. Like when I see the emails between her and Susan with me, you know, I think she brings creativity and substance and, and, and gravitas into our agency in a way that very few creative people in the industry can. So I think you're going to see things very quickly. Um, I think with Rohit and her as a partnership. Um, but you know, you look at Nitin who we just promoted from within, you know, we've got, we've, it's an exciting time. I'm aware of some perceptions. I think. Um, is this only an India perception, or do you think this would translate even for uh, the agency globally? Well, firstly, I don't agree with the perception. Okay, so fine. to be clear, okay. Um, okay. no. I think like, I've worked in several networks now, sure. and I think when you have a global network, you always have different agencies in different countries with different reputations. Sure. Let me just uh, move on to something. Uh, something that you just started. Uh, I believe that you've 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 set up a digital task force. Uh, for FCB globally. Yeah, how do you know that? <laughs> I haven't talked about it that much in the press. That's great. Okay. So uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to I want to ask you about why you thought why do you why do you think that it was important to do so, uh, and how is this task force really uh, getting their hands dirty and you know supplying whatever they need in terms of data knowledge etc. to uh, you know the different counterparts across the world. What I what I realized when I arrived is I certainly was not going to come in like a knight in shining armor and tell everybody you need to be digital. And I also didn't feel that I wanted to buy a digital network and then give that responsibility to someone else. So I took the chief strategy officer, the head of our chief client officer who runs all our client relationships, um, a CEO who's written the best business plans I've ever seen in my career, and then two digital natives, two, two people who really are fluent in digital. Sure. And I said to the five of them, you know, between all those areas of expertise, you know exactly what clients want right now. You have some digital expertise. You've got someone on the team who knows how to write business plans. I want you to work with the top 12 CEOs and their teams around the world and work out how good we are, where we can be better, and what we need to invest in. Uh, and it's amazing when you empower a group of really talented people, what they can come up with, because what they developed uh, in terms of uh, working tools for every office to go through and then analyze where they need help and where they don't, um, inspiring through new partnerships we never would have dreamed of. We've accelerated, I think, how we work as an agency. But, you know, 30, over 30% 30 of our, our revenues today are in digital. So we are a digital agency already. The question was, how do we get people to feel they, you don't delegate that to a chief digital officer. Everyone has to reinvent themselves because today everything is digital. So sure. it's a bit ridiculous to say, you know, well, we're going to have a digital department. You know, Carter, it's interesting you talk about creative culture, right? It's interesting only because, as you would know, very recently Martin Sorrell talked about a bold statement to make that, you know, we, we are not in the advertising business, right? And, and, and He's, he, uh, you know, he's said a lot of that to support why he's saying that. Would you be in agreement with him? I know he's a rival, uh, <laughs> he's a rival, he's a big rival, but nevertheless. I don't think I would ever say that we're not in the advertising business. I mean, I don't agree with that statement at all. The word advertising is loaded with many, 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 many expressions, which is perhaps why he made that statement. But I still don't agree with that, that as a statement in and of itself. You know, advertising today is about, I think, always being on, always learning, um, never being finished with what you're doing, being iterative. But creativity has to be at the heart of advertising. You know, when you say advertising, I think about great minds and creative thinkers really solving client problems that they cannot do on their own. That's for me when advertising is, 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 is really successful. I just want you to just give me some quick data facts on, on the US market today. If you were to tell me in terms of media spends, what the divide would be when we talk of traditional versus digital, uh, where, where are they in that entire pie? So you mean the industry? Yeah, the industry, um, you in know, terms of ad spends. Well, <laughs> depends who you get the data from. If, if you, yeah, go exactly. to, you know, I think if you go to smaller companies with smaller budgets, um, I think they are predominantly digital. I think when you go to the, the large multi, multinationals that have huge spends, 
you know, it's getting closer and closer to, uh, to 40, 50 percent, as, as I see it. But again, it depends. Do you think that's a smart move? I think it depends. You know, I was with uh, one of my counterparts having lunch uh, the other day talking through about this very question. And he said something I thought was, was interesting. He said, you know, if someone came to me and said, I have a $50 million, a $10 million business, sure. and I want to make it a $20 million business, I could do it 100% digital spend, and I think I could make it into, into that business. If you come to me with a billion dollar business and say you want to be 100% digital, I could probably guarantee you it'll be a $900 million business <laughs> at some point soon. Uh, digital now is everywhere. Sure. So I think, I think it's sort of evolving to a place where when you say, should an idea be digital? Well, everything is digital in a yeah, sense. Exactly. I think where, it, where I start getting a little worried is when clients take disproportionately large parts of their budget and put it in social media. Um, I think you have to be very focused when you do that and there has to be a clear reason for doing. When you do, it can be very effective. But I agree with you that everyone saying, I have to take a formulaic part of my budget and put it into social media is just as bad as saying, I have to take a formulaic part of my budget and put it in television sure. advertising. Yeah. yeah, because today for us, I mean, in India at least, digital is essentially TV on digital, or rather, a, a, you know, a 30 second spot converted to a seven and a half minute spot because you can, right? right? And it's on YouTube, and that's a great digital strategy. So, I mean, I really don't know where we're going in terms of actual evolution of, you know, well, of, I think, of this platform. I mean, I think if you'll be reporting on it, I think you're going to see a wave of change in India um, following suit of what we've seen happen in other countries of the world. So. You know, if you go to Korea and you go to Japan, you look at the United States, those are places where there's some really interesting things happening in digital. So I think it's, uh, it's never been a more exciting time to be in marketing in India. I think there's some really interesting things that can be done in the years ahead. Frankly, that play on the global stage, not just in India. Sure. Well, we hope so. And we hope <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> We've been hearing that for a while, but we, we truly hope so. On that note, thank you so much, Kara. This has truly been wonderful, and hopefully we'll meet again in Cannes. Thank you. I appreciate you having me over. Welcome back. The show's called Brand Equity, and I'm Sonali Krishna. Now, the social networking behemoth Facebook is all set and gearing up to launch its panking new product called Facebook at Work. Facebook at Work, to put it simply, is like a company's intranet that allows employees to communicate seamlessly. Facebook is playing to its strength, which is really familiarity with its interface, as most of us are very comfortable with Facebook's features. Well, Facebook's global director is in India and is joining us right now to talk about this ambitious project. Thanks so much for joining us, Julian. Truly a pleasure having you on Brand Equity. Thank you, Sonali. Thanks for inviting me. So tell me, Julian, first things first, what brings you to India? So I'm here in India with the team uh, to talk about the momentum we've been having in the last few months with Facebook at Work, which is a new initiative that we launched a few months ago. Uh, it's basically Facebook for the workplace to create a more connected and a more productive workplace. And we've been amazed by the momentum we've had in India. So we are here with the team today and the whole week to meet existing customers, but also companies that are about to launch Facebook at Work in the coming weeks. So I know that you're still in your beta testing stages, but could you give me a sense as to when uh, Facebook at Work formally will be launched? So it's coming in the next few months. Uh, we are still testing the product in different right. industries, in different geographies. Uh, just yesterday, we launched with Yes right. Bank, and you know we are getting closer to launch, but I'm very confident we will be launching in the coming months. So Julian, if I could ask you to flash back in time and give me a sense as to how Facebook yep. at work, the idea was given birth to. So if you use Facebook, you're pretty familiar today with the value of being connected to your friends and to your family. Uh, I would say that Facebook at work brings the same value, but to the workplace, just for you and your colleagues. Uh, the mission we have is to connect the 3 billion people who are employed. It's for everyone in the company, not just the CEO, but truly everyone, right. even people who never had an email before. But we, we have the, the, the highest level of ambition for this new initiative, which is the new uh, app in the Facebook family of apps. So, you know, Facebook is competing against the hot super startup Yammer and Slack. Uh, that has, I believe, become the fastest growing business app of all time. How are you dealing with this competition? I think, you know, what's unique about Facebook at work is the ambition we have to connect everyone. Once again, if it's just for 10 people in the company or just one team inside the company, it doesn't work. 
And, and what we've seen, because we've, we've tested and we've deployed many companies, more than 450 so far, is that Facebook at work is a tool for everyone in the company. I wouldn't say that we compete with these companies. We tend to compete more with emails in general, with mailing lists, with newsletters, with intranets, all of these things that, that people still you know, don't want to use in 2016. Uh, so I think the main difference here is the ambition we have and also the accessibility of the software we built. But once again, 1.6 billion people know how to use Facebook. So it would be pretty easy for them uh, to know how to use Facebook at work. But Julian, don't you think, given Slack's current popularity, it would only make strategic sense for Facebook to acquire Slack at some point in time? Well, it's not my job uh, to, to work on you know, acquisitions and all of that. We think that we have invested a lot in making Facebook a very accessible tool in the world of you know, consumer. And we want to bring the same tool and the same you know, value and feeling of being connected to the workplace. And based on the success we've seen so far with the 400, 500 companies who've been launching and, and, and testing Facebook at work, we are very confident on the potential of, of that product. Give me a sense as to which markets uh, you've soft launched Facebook at work in. So I think today we are present in more than 60 countries. Uh, in India, we've been amazed by the momentum. We've launched with companies like LNT Infotech, like Godresh, uh, like YesBank. Uh, so I would say traditional companies, but we've also uh, seen companies like uh, Zomato or Delivery, you know, fast growing startup launching very successfully. Would you say, Julian, that the biggest challenge for Facebook today is taking it from the social fun experience that we're all so familiar with to actually doing work on it? I wouldn't say it's a challenge because don't forget that Facebook at work is just for you and your colleagues. Uh, as I said, it looks a lot like Facebook. It's using... I would say the same core features of Facebook, newsfeed, groups, uh, messenger, timeline, and search. But when you apply that product uh, to the context of the workplace, just for you and your colleagues, uh, you know, a lot of productivity happens. And once again, the mission we have is to make the, the, the workplace more connected because right. a more connected workplace becomes a more productive workplace. You know, given that you have over 400 clients on board, uh, you must have had uh, some feedback session. Give me a sense as to what are clients telling you, both positive and negative, when it comes to the product. Well, I think what people really appreciate with Facebook at work is to feel that for the first time, when they go to work, they have a tool that, that keeps getting better because we update the product all the time. 95% uh, of what we build for Facebook is integrated onto Facebook at work. And companies that are using it really love the fact that it's getting better, faster, nicer all the time. Uh, and it's mobile first, just like Facebook. We build Facebook at work in the, with a mobile first mindset. Uh, I would say the challenge, which is something that we are also learning ourselves, is to make sure that 100% of the company is using it. Uh, and so we are learning every day. At every, every launch is an opportunity for us to learn. We work with a lot of IT teams to make sure that Facebook at work is deeply integrated with the existing IT systems. Think of Microsoft, Azure AD, Okta, OneLogin, and Ping, or Active Directory. So that's, uh, that's, I would say, one of the things we're working on. On that note, Julian, thank you so much for taking time out and joining us, and we wish you a fantastic India stay. Thanks a lot, Sonali. Have a good day. Welcome back. You're watching Brand Equity, and I'm Sonali Krishna. Traditional norms dictate that a job of a CEO belongs to a person who is usually between the age of 40 and 45. But breaking all those norms are Sanjay and Shravan Kumaran, who became CEOs even before entering their teens. Shocked? So were we. They started their app-building company, Go Dimensions, in 2012 at the tender ages of 10. Well, the boys are certainly going places in the app world and we at Brand Equity got them talking about their very unique childhood and why they traded dirtying themselves in the mud and watching cartoon channels to become CEOs. This is a really interesting watch. So actually, like me and my brother like really, really love games and we really love playing games. So we've always had this passion of wanting to create our own game and uh, playing the game that we ourselves created. As me and my brother had many game ideas and many application ideas, we wanted to create our own. So yeah, it, it actually, we really feel proud being the youngest CEOs and it is pretty a cool title like to have your own company and stuff. So, but for us, it's just like another day, like uh, 
we both just discuss our own ideas and then we get to work we both follow a plan which is that we study for 2 hours and then we play for 1 hour and then we uh i think program for one hour or do something creative and we both don't use facebook uh, so we save about 2 hours on like our classmates i think the person that really inspired me and my brother to create all of these applications are steve jobs and bill gates steve jobs in his ui and ux if you've seen an apple product it looks so very very beautiful and you'd like just want to use it and you, it feels so good when using an iphone so that's what really helped us like in the sense like whenever we make an application we always want it to look very very nice yeah so the first app that me and my brother created was called catch me cop before releasing even our first application we more we made over 126 test applications the second app is an educational app which we developed it's called alphabet board so our mother kept telling us that we should make an educational app also like to teach kids so we thought about it and then we started to develop this app called alphabet board where we teach kids the alphabets o w x and the next app which we developed is called prayer planet we were all traveling in the flight to us and there was a lot of turbulence so we wanted to pray god and like we want there was no idol so what we did was we thought of an idea like where we can take the uh, phone and pray god using it and the app after that is called color palette which is an app for learning colors r e d red uh, my favorite application that i made was emergency booth as this was one of the most helpful app to the public in the sense that using this app like for example if you're in em any emergency situation is very very difficult to actually dial the emergency lines and to actually get to them because it's very very complicated to think at that situation so what we did was an easy app so that you could easily navigate and call any of the mobile numbers to call any of the emergency services and then we developed an app called superhero jetpack ei5 and then last we developed the uh, app called car racing hd which got over 1000 downloads in 2000 downloads in just the first day which was really really cool so me and my brother have also been working on our own virtual reality device which tends to do virtual reality by just using your phone using this virtual reality device we've connected it to our uh, desktop computer and also our xbox one So what we do is any of the games whatever we're seeing on our Xbox one we're essentially trying to uh, change this content to make it uh, into 3D which is essentially like try to make this figure into two different parts so that it's uh, cleanly seen by the eyes we have made a working prototype out of it kind of makes you wonder what you've been up to doesn't it well on that note it's time to wrap it up right here on brand equity we hope you enjoyed the show to take the time and drop us a line at brand equity at etnow.tv or alternatively log on to our facebook page that's facebook.com/brandequity and tell us what you thought of the show you could do the same on twitter at brand equity live i'll see you next week same time same place until then ciao ciao